1880s, King Menelik, named after the progenitor of the Solomonic Empire and determined to expand that empire as far as his diplomatic abilities and the might of his armies would permit, had recently remarried, his second union, her fifth, when the royal household picked their way down the slopes of Ndodda and pitched their tents on the plateau below. The land was lush with grasses and flowering trees, but most important to a king who suffered from rheumatism were the hot springs that bubbled out of the ground and seeped sulphurous into the red earth. His wife, Aitu, stood at the door of their tent and looked out. She was formidable, a woman who, beyond her already rare accomplishments, the ability to read and write Amharic, to play chess and the lyre, to compose poetry, was decisive and forthright, physically brave and gifted in the oblique arts of acquiring and keeping power. May I build a house here? she asked. Menelik had no objection, remembered in fact a prophecy his grandfather had made that one day there would be a city on this spot. The next year, while Menelik was in the south, overthrowing the emirate at Harar, Taitu made the prophecy reality, moving down the mountain. Remembering the cascades of lemon yellow mimosa blossom that had surrounded their tent, she named the new city Addis Ababa, or New Flower. Three years later, Johannes IV fell in battle against the Mardis, the Matamba, and Menelik became emperor of all Ethiopia. He insisted the coronation be held in the church his queen had established at the top of the mountain, but it was a last hurrah. A palace already existed on the plateau below, with neighbourhoods emerging around it according to the configuration of a camped army. It burned down three years later, but Menelik II, simply, Menelik now the second, simply built another on a brow of land overlooking the steaming springs. A three-storey living complex ringed with balconies and topped at one end by a dome, kitchens, stables, embroidery rooms, smithies, arsenals, anteroom after anteroom and a vast reception hall, each of whose three gables boasted a row of 50 ostrich eggs. Indoors, under electric lights and stained glass windows, soldiers, peasants and priests could feast on raw beef and beer at a rate of nearly 7,000 guests per sitting. Four years later, 100,000 fighting men and a roughly equal number of camp followers marched north with Menelik II and his empress, who personally led 5,000 men into battle. She also organised over 10,000 women, ensuring they carried drinking waters to the troops and directed with her husband the building of a defence perimeter. Their decisive victory over the Italians at Adwa sealed the importance of Addis Ababa as the first fixed capital of an independent Ethiopian state since the collapse of the Gondorian kingdom over a century earlier. Menelik II enjoyed their achievements for only a decade. He suffered strokes and declined into paralysis and senility, while his wife, feared and eventually outmaneuvered, was confined to his sick room and then, when he died, sent back up the cold mountain to live out her days in a modest house in the grounds of Ndot or Mariam church. His heir spent little time in his grandfather's palace, in any case would deposed within three years by nobles and clerics appalled, they said, by his favouring of, or attempts to bring equality to, the Muslims of his empire. He was replaced by Ethiopia's first empress, the far more biddable Zoditu. Zoditu's modernising successor, Haile Selassie, had built his own home as soon as he decently could. Within four years of his coronation, work began on a new palace, up the hill from the old one. It was finished only seven months later, in time for a visit for the Crown Prince of Sweden. The old Gubbi bustled still, Lions paced their cages or sprawled across the entrance to the throne room, where visitors could bring themselves to step past them, could inspect gold pillars, Persian carpet, and Manlik II's throne, hung with silk. But in many ways, the centre of power had moved to a cold, cool European-influenced two-storey building surrounded by gardens. Haile Selassie I called it Gannat al paradise of the prince. At dawn each morning, Haile Selassie rose from his small bed with its crowned canopy and embossed coverlet of silver blue and went to his desk to read, to write, to think about the day ahead. Though sometimes there would have been so many petitions, so much work to get through, he would not have been to bed at all. By 7am he was at prayer and then at exercises. Any grandchild who burst in at this hour received a good scolding. Before breakfast at 8.30 in the beginning of his public day. If he looked up, he could see the tops of the mature trees that now shaded his gardens, and he could see the spiral staircase not far from his front door. It had no use as a staircase, was not attached to any building, it simply climbed into the sky. The Italians had built it, one stone step for every year of fascist rule, beginning with the march on Rome in 1922. When Haile Selassie returned, he had claimed the structure for himself by placing on the highest step a stone lion. He looked down again and continued his work. 
down at the bottom of the hill, roughly halfway between the old palace and the new, Yethamanyu woke too, bullied towards consciousness by the hard earth beneath her hips. When her husband died, she had felt she had to follow all the traditions of deep mourning, shaving her head, eschewing the comfort of a bed. Much later, she would wonder what it was all for. No amount of self-abnegation, and she had slept on the ground for a full three years, was ever going to bring back the dead. Carefully, she rose, wrapped herself in warm shawls, and let herself out into the dawn. At this hour, the streets were mercifully clear. The occasional stray dog, perhaps, nosing through a rubbish heap, night watchmen, country women bent under wide loads of firewood. Were they widows too? How many children did they have to feed? The cathedral grounds were quiet, but not unpopulated. Lone women approached its walls, kissed its thresholds in private supplication. Lone men read under the trees. When she returned, the sun had crested the mountains and the air was warm. Her daughters were awake and the compound smelled of roasting coffee. She sipped three small cups, saying little, eating nothing, waiting to give the prayers a benediction, which she said quickly, intent and musical, hands held palms up to heaven before standing to leave the house again. Be careful, called her Eritrean mother, Eritrean neighbour. Sometimes, when this neighbour felt worried about the children left to fend for themselves, she brought them fresh bread, hugged them. You're always crying, she said to their mother. I'm surprised you can see. Watch out for the cars. Up the hill, past the square with its curving bank and facing post office, past the leafy grounds of the Archbishop's residence, St Mary's, his church, the Supreme Court, into a smaller square where the victims of the Graziana massacre writhed in bronze across a needle of white marble, through the vast stone gates after some negotiation with the guards, and now practiced listing of names and connections, or a surreptitious exchange of coins up the wide avenue, flanked by lawns and flowers and trees. She was part of a flow now, all tending towards the same point. Ministers and sub-ministers and sub-sub-ministers who knew that basic self-preservation required them to bow to the emperor, and for the emperor to see them bow, and for their colleagues to see the emperor see them bow each morning before work. Petitioners like herself, who also came nearly every morning, sometimes for years. She looked up, searching above the heads for the lion on his airy steps and made her way towards him. She found a patch of shade and then she settled down to wait.